especially the ones that I know. Good to see you again. Oh, so yeah, I think they doubled up. Oh, yeah. It's probably been three and a half years, although I, I definitely have flown with some of you guys since I've left in your own personal airplanes and done a little bit of stuff, so that's fun. I miss a lot of you guys, and I miss instructing. Um, it's, it's a little hard with my current schedule and a woman in my life, but I try to make it work. Um, I stayed single engine current for a long time because I was also flying our company Pilatus. So believe it or not, our 10,000 pound Pilatus the jet didn't keep me take off and landing 90 day current, but a Cessna 152 did, legally. <laughs> it was a completely different bird. But I've come out here uh, several times in the middle of the night and done uh, my 90 day currencies in the 152 to continue my night currency because I was flying air ambulance uh, in both the Falcon 10 jet and then the Platus. I'm working at Club Jet, which primarily is out of Anoka right now. Uh, we keep most of our airplanes all over and we'll just airline out and then do our routine and airline back uh, home. We're working uh, 11 days on is a little bit long, but then they give us nine off. So it's kind of a, kind of a nice schedule. Um, Greg Philbrandt is my name, so appreciate you coming. I, I did some hands on who was here last week already. Um, how many of you guys have instrument ratings? Oh, good, then I'm actually getting to speak to some guys who know and have some stuff. And then uh, I'm assuming, how many, do we have student pilots that are not rated yet? Do we have anybody? So we've got at least a bunch of privates, a couple, good, thank you. And then how many guys bothered to do that commercial ticket so your insurance would go down? You got a couple? There you go, and those are the same guys that own airplanes or no? Yeah, that's typically what it is. Your insurance rate will go down so you, you get through that set of maneuvers. All right, um, I really, really wanted to do last week's icing. I've got a lot of Minnesota experience. I've got about 9,000 hours. I've got about 5,000 hours of dual given, which means I have had the FAA through back doors say, you be careful in the winter when I've been doing a bunch of my instrument training. I think it's very important for the instrument guys to get some actual experience. Um, and obviously there's days when there's a 300 foot thick layer that's not gonna be a big deal icing that I might have said, let's go flying. Um, but, you know, you've got to be careful. So I'm going to review a little bit of icing in the first few minutes, and then we're going to do some instrument stuff. I didn't realize we were going to have this many instrument pilots here, or I might have included some of the really weird, challenging stuff that intimidates me and would be interesting for you. Let's see. They didn't tell me anything, but let's find out if that's the PowerPoint clicker. <gasps> see, now I don't know how to go back. Now, last frame. There it is. Learn from others' mistakes. You won't live long enough to make them all yourself. <laughs> Where I did a bunch of my instructing at Maple Lake, the boss had this on the door going out to the hangar from the office area. And I read it for four years, flying charter and doing instructing at this place. And it's well said, because we won't be able to make all the mistakes that others have made, and we wouldn't live through them. I tried to kill myself about two or three times. But I told you I had 5,000 hours of dual given, so I have hundreds of attacks on me, you know, across the years, so that's easy. He probably picked up some really good icing pictures last week. And he, do we want to try to squeeze a few more of you guys in? I know it's standing room or push some chairs back, but we got so many in the hall, I don't know if they can see or hear very well. Oh, love it. Hey, Keith, do I have permission to use your image in this presentation? Good, because you're in it. <laughs> Hope the fire marshal doesn't come. Shh. There's a window. We have an escape route. It just happens to have metal wire in it. Oh, let's bring up this while we're at it. This, did he get this during the flying, or when did he get this? Overnight. Overnight, sitting on the ground. So you get up, and you go out to your car at the hotel or the home, and you go, oh, crap. Can we take a cloth and polish this smooth like we used to do for 20 years and go flying? I got some heads still shaking, yes, but they're older than me. Okay, that's what we used to do forever. There have been enough <coughs> significant accidents now from people that polished the airplane and still went and had performance issues. Now, a lot of them were bigger, heavier airplanes with a smaller wing, but the FAA has taken away that permission to do these. What they want you to do is pull it in a hot hanger, <laughs> hot, warm, melt it all, dry it, towel it off so it doesn't freeze when you pull it back off, or get de-iced. Who's got de-iced? 
Have you foot the bill for that? Oh, okay, you have them. Maybe a small. I thought when you, you were talking about 747s earlier. Okay, well, but, those are expensive. dollars. <laughs> yeah, for de-icing. So you look at your ticket price every time they got to pull in and they de-ice your airline. You're like, oh. Um, even the small jets, it's easy to go four or five grand on a de-ice. And even though you try to talk the guys to go, because you've got a little bit of frost, they know their boss is making money by the gallon. <laughs> you know, so it's interesting. But no, you're not supposed to polish and go anymore. They don't like that idea at all. Because that, you end up like that. So these that I've put on here were actually icing accidents and incidents. Obviously an accident here. Doesn't look like the pilots fared very well on that one. Even more ice, less where he was blowing the boots. Um, I've been in airplanes that have looked like this. I've been in airplanes that have flown with boots that the ice ridge at the top of the boot started to grow to be about a half inch. I was happy to get it on the ground fairly quickly after that. That must have been extreme in the spinner of a jet engine and on the incoming veins. He starts sucking these pieces through. He's gonna, he's gonna at least wreck the engine if not crash it and blow it up and, and have it shut down on him right there. So that would probably have been an extreme condition. This one I wanted to show you because it's got this characteristic. So here's the wing. With the airflow and the impact, it's starting to build kind of that odd T-shape. Who knows what airfoil loves to do this? Mooney owners. This is a typical Mooney growth because of the design of that wing not very aerodynamic. This is a crappy, <laughs> crappy wing. Uh, Cessna 172, well, we're, you know what? We're gonna get to some <clears throat> warrior that's not named. I hope the end number's not on there. That's got a little bit on it. And, and a lot of those airfoils will just take a little bit and grow the shape of the wing. That's at least a little bit more aerodynamic than that. Um, Somebody, obviously, I didn't do it, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. to protect the end number on that one and to make a point. Um, but again, I pulled these off an FAA thing, and these were incidents and accidents related to icing uh, problems. So he didn't end up very well. They showed a little bit here, but the white on white's kind of hard to do, especially in such crappy pictures. Who knows what you need heated windshields for? No icing. There you go. That did not look like a fun day with just the heat plate working on the pilot side. Um, there have been guys who haven't worked or who haven't had them who've got all caked up and have landed with a little side window. Who's got their instrument rating from me? Did I make you land at some airport on an ILS without ever looking out the window? St. Paul. <laughs> I've done this with every single one of my pilots. Covered up the windshield or kept them under the foggles and said, don't look up, I will not let you smack the nose wheel. I want you to land this out of an ILS approach, touchdown, done, zero, zero. Because you might get stuck in this situation some point. And you just gotta, you gotta go find the longest runway you can find. You know, if it's MSP or, you know, Duluth, if you're stuck with St. Paul, but it's long enough for what you're doing in a little single engine airplane and just fly that ILS as good as you've ever done one until you hit the ground and chop the throttles you grew. Because if you ever had to do that, I want you to survive through it. Look at all the pretty colors. I love radar when it's clear. Pink is my favorite color. <laughs> I'll show you my underwear. What's the pink? Mixed. Mixed. Slush, sleet, freezing precipitation. Oh. Where was this airplane going? Right in the middle of some moderate precipitation with a little bit of borderline heavy and we're right on the freezing level, aren't we? Ish. I'm so glad I fly known icing equipment now. I love heated wings in my jet. I have one thing really funny about the jet. I'm flying a Falcon Dassault Falcon 10. The actual, I should have brought a picture, I didn't think about it until just now. The actual airplane AFD flight manual says, the tail has no anti-icing. The tail will ice up, plane will fly fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, wow, those guys are confident little. So I should have done that in a French accent. But uh, yeah, that's what it says, it's really bizarre. Um, unbelievable that the US certified that with that statement in the book, I love it. Um, just another day. 
that's not too bad. I'm not sure why I threw that in there. Maybe, okay, just probably the pink. We're right on that edge of here. Small plane. Warrior. Color somebody might recognize. I did not fly this flight, and we won't say who did. Um, this is why we want heated those anyway. This is your best indicator on a Piper product of where that ice is starting to grow because you can see it and it's disrupting the airflow and you're starting to get it there as early as anything on that, that temperature probe with the temp right there. Uh, looks like a little bit more on the prop. Another, I think that was a King Air 90 accident due to icing. That looks like he got it flying. It looks like his windshield's completely kicked over. I'm not sure that that was, it just look, it's on the front of the struts. So that's just nasty. This dude had his window open going, ah, when he landed. Um, that one doesn't look like the pilots fared very well again. That guy's going, look at the cake of ice on my windshield, Aurora, Illinois. Severe icing, no injuries. Unfortunately, on a lot of those other ones, they were fatalities. One more thing with the icing to think about. Induction icing, carburetor icing. If you're getting that kind of ice on your windshield, what's it doing to your filter? What's it doing to your screen? What's it doing to your carb? Um, and again, carburetor icing, you get that 30, 40 degree drop from outside temperature. So even in humid conditions at 60 degrees, you can get carburetor icing. So if you just think you need it, pull it on. Pull it on full and just use it. You're going to give up a little bit of um, power, but it'll keep you clear. Don't play with it. Don't go a quarter, you know, unless you've got one of the really old Cessnas with two carb heats. And never mind, we won't even talk about that unless you own one. Um, if you have a constant speed propeller <coughs> and you're starting to get into some icing conditions, what should you do with your propeller? Cycle it. Cycle it. See if you can throw them off. Uh, go high RPM. Keep it spinning as fast as you can to try to maybe throw it off, but cycle it. Um, they should just make flexible wings, you know, like those big airliners, because then you could just go like this and, and flex it and they'd all break off the wings, right? No, I'm kidding. but. Um, so that was an accident that was fatal and that they determined was carburetor ice. I can't say why the windshield was out on that one, but maybe it was in the rescue. Stay safe. Stay out of the icing. There are so many good tools for your pre-flight planning. Uh, the CSIP, the, the you know pilot reports are the biggest one. What we used to say in the charter world is make sure you're the first guy out because there's no reports yet if you were flying cargo. <laughs> And then, of course, we always had that quandary of reporting it because then you should do something about it and get out of it, you know, but that's welcome to flying. Do your pre-flight planning and prep. If you get into it, don't just sit there and go, ice! Ice! Don't stay there. Climb, descend, turn around, land, do something, but do it now. Um, Later, I'm going to get into the C's when you get in IMC and you're not supposed to, but climb, confess, comply, conserve, you know, it's just do something and do something now. Um, go up, go down, turn around, just don't sit in it, land at the nearest airport. Do, here's one that this happens in, in Minneapolis all the time. You're coming back from Chicago or wherever, and they want you down at a low four or 5,000 foot altitude, like 50 miles from the class B. If you know that there's a good chance of icing in there and you're sitting up at 6,000 feet, argue with them. Cessna 1, 2, 3, 4, Foxtrot said to maintain 4,000. Unable. I'm right on top of this cloud deck. I'm in the sun. I really like it. There might be icing down there. You can vector me home via Wilmer if you want to, but I'm staying at 6,000 until I'm on final on the ILS 9 right at Flying Cloud, okay? Roger. Turn left, heading 270. Mm -hmm. But this is a much better scenario for you, hope you run enough fuel, than it is to drop down 75 miles, you know, an hour or 45 minutes from your destination into some icing conditions. You're the PIC. 
all right, I'm not gonna read it, but I read a bunch of stuff. I didn't put it in here, but one of the ones that kind of sticks out on here is uh, an airline crew said, all right, uh, we're lining up for the ILS uh, nine right. I'm sorry, the ILS is out of service. Okay, we're setting up for the uh, VOR uh, 10 right then. Uh, VOR's got a flag. He goes, how about the NDB? He goes, uh, we're too full for saturation. And he, and he says, all right, ATC, uh, airline one, two, three, four, uh, we will state your intentions, sir. <laughs> you know, so they finally turned it around to air traffic control. Said, well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> so um, just fits, turn it around, turn the tables, remember you're the PIC, and this is just what I just said. You can vector me all the way around the cities if you need, but I'm unable to descend due to the possible icing conditions. Hold your own. Say, what's a mountain goat doing way up here in that cloud bank? <laughs> this goes with the video. Okay. Farside's got some really good ones. You, you seen the turbulence one? I didn't put it on here, but he goes, hey, ladies and gentlemen, you know, please buck your seatbelts. There's some turbulence ahead. The pilots are up front going. <laughs> <laughs> and then like the fourth frames. Oh, I think we're through the turbulence. Wait. <laughs> I have to talk to him about the lighting in here. This is a little crap. Oh, well, I didn't mean to go that far, but there you go. All right. Uh, no, do it for a few minutes. We're not taking, we're taking notes. I like you guys. I like you guys. I have seen every month or two, I still go out there and go, oh, and I get to see something just so cool that I've never seen before. Um, I think this one was coming back from like the Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico. We had a parts run for Delta or Endeavor or somebody in the middle of the night. Rather than stay there, we just repositioned to Fort Lauderdale. So we left at like four in the morning. So this was probably like 5.30 in the morning at the sunrise. I was at like 36,000 feet, give or take. And they had a few of these storms going, oh. And you know those ones that last overnight were mamas yesterday. And these are well above me. Just unbelievable, you know, what's left of these storms, probably 45, 50,000 feet with some anvils going the wrong way. And this I've put on my iPad. This is my home, this is my page on my computer. I just, this shot is like, so. So I still see stuff once in a while. That's just so cool. I've got somewhere in here, I queued up at the end, a couple of Northern Lights pictures too. And I'm like, oh, just love it. There's my wing. Eek. All right, here's where I was going to play the video that we already watched. Who's that? He didn't come. <laughs> Learn to do this. Ah, turn it off again. This is, this is fun. You love going from that. Let's see, how's he doing? Straight level. He's got a deflection on the number one. Yeah, maybe he's doing the localizer. Yeah, he's, he's probably intercepting the localizer. He's doing better now, see, he's doing better. He's got himself a five, 600 foot per minute rate of descent going, 12, 1300, the elevation around here is nine. So he's, he's getting down there, it's three, 400. Oh, <laughs> home. So you don't end up like this. Lots of good reasons to get your instrument writing. If nothing else, go out with an instructor, get some actual just fly so you can learn to fly the airplane. I think that all the stats are like it takes you about 200 seconds to kill yourself when you go VMC into IMC and you don't have any training because you get all messed up and you go gone dark. So it's worth going out on your BFR, especially if you're in some rain. Don't let him get away with just no hood work. I know you don't have to, it's up to the discretion of the instructor. But do it, do some hood work, do the stuff you don't do. Do the unusual attitudes. Go out and do some stalls under the hood so you're able and capable and confident about that recovery. And go ahead and finish with an approach. <clears throat> Circle the land, do a hold, do some of the stuff that even if you're instrument and current that you're not doing all the time. How often do you do missed approaches? Eh, not very often. How often do you do holds? Same, not very often. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody recognize where this is on the field? <coughs> this was here. <laughs> Somebody thought that might work out better than the foggles until they got the engines. I don't know. 
in her defense, what she was doing, she was this aircraft was up for sale. She was going to take pictures of the cockpit, and she was going to get much better lighting, turning up the lights and covering the windshield. But I just thought that was a great picture. <laughs> Cessna, Citation Foggles. How's he doing? Let's see. Oh, he's not an IFRL. See, what's up with that? Oh. <coughs> You can turn the light on. We got nothing to look at for a few minutes. <coughs> I once knew a kind of relatively cocky private pilot. He was probably about 23, 4 years old. Private pilot's license. 65 hours. Who thought it was fine to go fly? I mean, 1500s VFR, right? I'm talking 1500 broken overcast, yeah. And this individual took this guy down to some speaking engagement, left at night. Now, he was pretty good. He checked the forecasts and the whole thing, and it looked pretty good from point A to point B. Point A to point B was following I-90 down on the border. I could do that at night. And the forecast was good. Left maybe an hour after getting that forecast. Got about halfway from western Minnesota to eastern Minnesota. And, you know, all of a sudden you're, you're watching those taillights and headlights on I-90. And, and he said, all of a sudden they were gone. And you're like, oh, that freeway's pretty busy. I don't know. And you realize you turn on the landing light. What do they say about that? Turn it on. If you don't like what you see, turn it back off. So what did he see? What? Couple choices. What they teach us as private pilots, you know, do a really gentle 180. Get out of it. And then if that didn't work, I hope I'm at my MSA. Let down a couple hundred. Maybe you just popped up into this stuff 50 feet. So managed to do the 180. Turn around, descend a little. Whoo! Freeway lights again. Yes. Okay, this is a bad scenario. Now you know what happened is the ceiling got lower, 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 and finally forced you down to 600 feet or something. So now you're flying around at 500 feet. 65-hour private pilot. At night. At night. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> and trying to figure out what you're going to do. Probably thinking making it another 45 minutes or whatever your destination is not a good idea. So that was probably the best thought he had. So found, found a town, and I wish I remembered what he said, which town this was, down there, Worthington, and was just circling around for a while, just relaxing, <laughs> letting the adrenaline work his way out of the system at 450 feet AGL. Well, 501, I'm sorry. You can see the town. The Shopco parking lot was starting to look really <laughs> like a good idea, okay? But he wasn't so sure about the morning news. <laughs> All of a sudden, he's, you know, getting out his charts, kind of looking at what's up. He's like, well, okay, this is Worthington. God, the airport's like three miles north of here. Okay, we're going to change the circuit just a little bit. Hey, you can see the beacon go in the light a little bit in the bottom of the clouds. So that circuit got a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And it was the airport land. Cool. Walked to town, got a hotel room. Good weather the next day. Got the guy home to his destination on I-90 East. Spent the night there. Got up the next day, daylight. Did this kid learn his lesson? No, I had shaken his head no. What did he do? He had like 16, 1700 broken. It was only from here to here to get home. We can go up the freeway and then I know the area really good. We'll cut around from the west. It's VFR. Same thing. Got in trouble. Ceiling came down and down and down. Got back into it. Turned around, down a little. Just didn't work. Said, oh, for God's sake. Knowing there were some towers and those lovely big power lines. This guy said, I'm in an emergency situation. <laughs> Climbed up to about 5,500 feet. Did he have a clearance? Did he have an instrument rating? At least he had a Bode C transponder trying not to kill you in the 747. Climbed up VFR conditions. Call. I'm stuck on top. 
communicate, you know, climb, communicate, confess. I'm a VFR pilot. I'm here. Okay, squawk, whatever I did. We got you. Call these guys on this frequency. Okay. And conserve. So this kid was, again, at least smart enough to go, I don't know where I'm going or what I'm doing. I'm going to haul this thing back to about enough to just fly at you know my best speed and conserve my fuel for a little bit and then he's like well the weather's better south for now i think i'll just head a little bit south while they're working this out there were two airline pilots on this frequency going hey guy you'll be just fine i just took off from des moines and it was clear down there you know i mean it was so funny i'm like wait i who that guy <laughs> 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 and, you know, so went south, just stayed at, you know, the altitude. All of a sudden, you know, it got a scattered layer below, and it was like, okay, I'm good, guys. I got the ground. I'm, where do you want to go? I'll just go from where I took off with because I know people. So went back, landed. They're like, call. One, two, three, four, Foxtrot's on the ground here. Yeah, we'll cancel your IFR flight plan. Have a great day. Thanks. Click. That was it. Then this was a long time ago. <laughs> it's probably not what would happen today. Um, I love it, but this is pain. We're gonna play the LS30 video at Air Lake, but we're gonna skip it. Um, right there. Why don't you kill the lights again for a couple minutes? These are hard. Not that you need to memorize one approach or carry it with you, but it wouldn't be a bad idea if you just printed this one and kept it or the VOR, or both. 10 right, flying cloud. You know, if you do this with an instructor a couple times, well, that's a nice copy, isn't it? 109.7. Inbound course, 98 degrees. Stuber, 2,600 feet, down to 11.056, whatever it is. All right, um, so if you had most of this memorized and you did this one approach with an instructor until it kind of got drilled in your head, at least you'd have a mayday going home type of scenario if you got into trouble and stuck. Now, this is not my first choice to tell you to go do an approach, and it would never be a first choice to do an approach down to low weather. If you have enough fuel on board, go find good VFR weather. Talk to somebody, use your Garmin, talk to flight service, talk to approach. Talk on 21.5 if you don't know anybody or any other frequency to get another frequency to do something. Conserve your gas, be smart, know what your weather is. Even as an instrument pilot, I was teaching all my guys then and now, when you take off, if things just go to crap, like you lost all of your instruments, where are you going? Where is it clear below 6,000 feet? So you can just point southwest, descend to 6,000 feet well above all you know obstacles and get into VFR conditions. If you had no ability to communicate, no ability to navigate, and you can't do an approach, you know, do you know where that is? Did you do enough homework to say, wow, 200 miles, Northeast today, 200 miles southwest today, is the best place to go where there's some really good VFR weather. It's a good, good piece of your homework. What's this? DME ARC, based off the 117.7 Flying Cloud VOR. A little higher. If you're talking to somebody, most of the time they're just going to vector you in at about a 35 degree angle and let that needle center up and turn in and follow that 98 degree needle. Is everybody carrying a garment or something as a backup? Mm -hmm. It's just a, whatever you have, it's the greatest idea in the world. Even if you just have four flight on your iPad and your iPad has a GPS, it's awesome because down at low altitudes and slow speeds that you guys are flying gonna work. So what if your radios go to kapunk? Use your cell phone. It'll work. It'll work low. It'll work slow. If you've got nothing, but do you have a couple of the phone numbers in here? Do you have Flying Cloud Tower? Do you have ATC? Do you, you know, you can do 800-992-7433, but for God's sakes, the way it's going these days, you're on hold 12 minutes just to open or close the flight plan or do anything, and they route you to the third wrong person. You know, it's about like calling your credit card company. I got checked by Facebook. Hang on. Actually, I'm looking up Flying Cloud's phone number. They're going to love me. Thank you. Anybody want to say it loud? Tower. 952 941 1188. Minneapolis Center. 888. 
766-8267. We should create column because it's probably been a while and they change those things. They're like, too many people know this number and they change it for safety. <laughs> All right, out here in this area, they've got you up about 2,700 feet, safe altitude with the obstructions that are out here. Once you start inbound and you get to Stuber, which is this radial off of Gopher, which is also this DME, I think it's 6.4 off of Flying Cloud, or it's also where this is your localizer needle, it's your runway center line, and then this one gives you your glide slope. So if you've got equipment in your airplane, most of you do with both the localizer needle and the glide slope, that's also where you're going to center up those two right here and then you're just going to keep those going all the way down. So this needle is equivalent to seeing your two red, two white on the Pappy roughly. It's going to keep you at a safe altitude to not hit anything all the way going in all the way down to the runway. You guys have a 5,000 foot runway here so that's good margin for most of the single and twins that you're all probably flying. The bottom line, 1,100 feet, 200. You need a half mile visibility. I'm Keith and I, we probably done that one a couple times down there to some lovely minimums. And uh, you know, again, I don't want you guys having to do that. It's not your first choice by any means, but maybe if it was 1,500 overcast, okay? Eight and 15 is 23. That means all you gotta do is just barely start this approach, get down 300 feet and you're gonna be in the clear. <sighs> I'm gonna live another day. Um, there are a lot of really weird and bizarre and I wasn't sure what my group is. Like I said, I found out so many were instrument rated, I think I would have included a few. Um, oh, I just came across that image and I went, damn. I love that because we fly up and down the East Coast a lot and it's always fun to see that. And of course, you know, that's probably off some satellite, but the, the whole reason that satellite's there is because half of these guys and that's not including, you know, this one and this one. I had a trip. I didn't even know what I was doing or who I was flying. We picked up some of these guys. They were doctors. Well, it turned out to be shuttle and Apollo commanders. I'm like, oh, for Pete's sake. So who was the least qualified guy in the airplane? The guy flying the left front seat. <laughs> so once I got there, they had this police escort and there was all this hoopla and I was like, who are these guys? <laughs> so I found out after the fact, love it. So there was a huge fundraiser uh, up in St. Cloud. So obviously this was a pretty public event and all these pictures are all over. But uh, what fun, what just fun. And of course now knowing that, in the 40 minutes before we took off from where I flew them up, I would have talked about something other than mm, the weather. And I'm glad I didn't make any cocky comments like, wow, we're flying a Falcon 10, that is a really fast, powerful <laughs> airplane. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Oh man, I got like a half inch of ice on my 172 one day. Yeah, these guys were some of the guys up there just trying to live a few more days. Oh, who that? Oh, he's wearing a hat. He's incognito sunglasses. He's in the room, but we won't say who it is. Quiz. There's another one. This just proved the FAA actually. Well, you weren't wearing foggles. We must have been doing some actual or just going somewhere. You were doing some training. A lot of lakes. That looks like Lake Minnetonka-ish. There's the funnest thing about flying the equipment I get to fly now. I'm over <laughs> half the weather, going around a little bit of it. This was, uh, oh, Madison-ish, coming home, maybe Chicago, Minneapolis. That was a doozy. It's beautiful, though. That's just a pretty picture. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> well, you guys probably seen a couple of these, but this is the approach into Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And if you use this transitional fix and you fly the missed approach, you, I taught, I taught, putty, tat, I did, I did. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> this is proof that the shortest distance between two points is never in a straight line if you're near New York. 
Because <laughs> this is exactly how we fly up here, okay? We can be at airports that are so close and they're like, oh no, you're either doing this or you're doing this. You are not going anywhere near JFK and Teterboro and the whole thing. I think the FAA needs to make another pilot's license. It's like, okay, here's your instrument rating, and now you need an endorsement to fly the East Coast, okay? <laughs> Seriously, it's so crazy. It's so busy. Um, there are some awesome, awesome audios, and I'm not going to play any of them here, but the ground controller's completely lost at who's in a row in JFK, and, you know, there's some bad words that get said on the radio, like the F word, and it's just, you got to Google some of that stuff. It's just incredible. If you're flying even a twin Cessna or some turbine, they're going to stick you with a departure procedure. If you're flying a twin Cessna or a single, you can say, screw you, I don't want to do that. But you have to file something like 5,000 feet when you leave here, or they're going to give it to you. Now, for years, I thought that was a great idea. And then I got the jet job and wished I hadn't ignored these so many times. I wish I'd practiced them a little bit more. Um, so this one, take off all runways. Oh, this is a terribly hard one. Fly a sign heading <laughs> altitude for radar vectors to the VOR, and then on the go for 293 radio to Kilobrew, and thence via whatever your transition is, expect clearance to the filed or flight level altitude 10 minutes after departure. With the Fargo transition from Killebrew, you go Fargo. So this one isn't super complicated. You're gonna give you a heading and a uh, altitude just like normal, and they're basically gonna vector you on. Are they gonna fly you to Gopher? Probably not. They're probably gonna push, they're probably gonna have you go here and out here somewhere, and then they're gonna tell you to go direct to you know, Homer or Kilbrew or Fargo down the road, or they'll give you a heading and tell you to join that departure. Some of them are more complicated. Some of them have cross Herbeck at 6,000, cross Homer at 10,000, cross Kilbrew at 12,000, you know, and so forth as you're departing. On the arrivals, it's definitely that way. And of course, you usually need something like those to bother with those. Anybody? It's, it's a short, small picture. What is it? <coughs> Mustang. I got to fly one once for a half hour. The, one of the guys I was flying in the Bonanza owned two businesses, and Cessna was courting him like crazy to buy something, so they flew it to Mankato. He called me up and said, you want to come down and fly this? I said, oh, I'll be there. What time? You know. So that was fun. And that was before I was Mr. Jet Guy. That was way, you know, Mr. Flight Instructor. <laughs> Photoshop to real. Photoshop. Yeah. But you know what? The the four tracks were there. So the tic tac toe board's real. It's just the X's and O's were fun. Here's a T Wolf 2 arrival in the flying cloud. And Minneapolis, depending on where you are. Um, so there is one that's a Fort Dodge transition, or they'll just tell you direct T Wolf Kiggy links in. Um, Vertical navigation planning information, expect 11,000. What do the two bars over and under mean? You're going to do that. Now, for the instrument rated guys, like the ILS into Teterboro, has an absolute boom on that instrument approach going in there at Mandy. And that's because <coughs> Newark's like landing right overhead on that approach. So they do not want you any higher because you're going to conflict with an airliner going in. And a lot of these are designed around the country. Manassas, Virginia, you got Dulles right there. They're landing north, you're in the way. So they take you off, turn you left, keep you low, step you up one, keep you low, and then let you loose once you're underneath, gone from the arrivals to the north into Dulles. So that's the purpose. I'm sorry, that was the departure. But that was the purpose of the departures and the arrivals just to keep all the jets in a row and then keep them on a 250 knot speed usually. And that way, if they're five, six miles apart, everybody stays their distance apart on the arrival and they know where they are. And then the poor air traffic controller gets to say the same thing for the two hours he's in there. Cross uh, target 11,000. Do you have information? Hotel at Minneapolis. Next airplane, cross target at 11,000. Uh, arrive on the arrival, you know. So he says the same thing over and over typically. So you've got, uh, if you're landing MSP, expect 11. All other airports, turbojets, eight. Turboprop, seven. And then the little guys like twin, you know, Cessnas and singles, they're going to dump us down to 5,000 feet. You're probably not even going to be on the arrival. 
all other airports from over target intersection. You're going to just do the Flying Cloud 180 radial, heading straight to Flying Cloud, DME, and then expect vector vector radar vectors from Flying Cloud. You know, so you'd go to the Flying Cloud VOR and they'd vector you to Anoka. They'd vector you to Crystal. They'll vector you somewhere else. If you're going to Flying Cloud, they're probably going to break you off earlier to do an approach. You know, a few miles before you get there. <coughs> And some more humor in the ATC system. This is the Piglet 4 arrival at Orlando, Florida. And if you look at all of these lovely coming in, and you have to be have kids and be a little bit more familiar with the movies. <laughs> <laughs> so it's nice to see that somebody has a couple senses of humor. Who's that? Where is that guy? Yes, <laughs> this is not real for everybody on YouTube. This is fake. <laughs> but it was just too fun. The original picture had mom holding him at the dock, but it was so easy to like, cut out mom's arm and put him in the middle of the lake and borrow one of those from another. The best part when you're IMC, so in meteorological conditions, when you're flying IMC, IFR, and you don't have to look for other traffic because you can focus on your instruments. In VMC conditions, even on an IFR flight plan, even an IFR blah blah, it's still your responsibility to watch for traffic. And I have been on IFR flight plans, still gotten within two to four or five hundred feet within other traffic a good four or five times in my career. So the ATC is human. We're all human. We're all trying to be nice. Anybody recognize the iPad loaded with four flight? This is the pro version where you can do the instrument overlay. You can import the instrument approach plate right on top of the map. You can change your map between VFR, IFR low, and IFR high. This one is with the Stratus puck. This is with the Stratus GPS. It's about 900 bucks, but it works with four flight and the iPad. And then you get a HARS. You get an attitude reference system. For an extra $24.99 a year, they just added synthetic vision. So now it'll start to show you the runway, towers, terrain for where you are, which is just crazy. So it's, it's insane that what you can do for 2000 bucks an iPad and a, a GPS, get some of the equivalent to the high end. Can you use this to fly IFR? No. If I ever lose my entire electrical, will I use it? Uh-huh. So here we're just kind of coming in, getting a little closer, getting a little closer. And I didn't show it, but when you get there, it goes to safe taxi mode when you've got the pro version too. It just shows you where you are on the airport diagram. And you can set it to automatically go to the airport diagram when you're like 40 knots. Pretty cool. What's he doing? He's jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. On top of another one. Oh, you saw that. <laughs> Anybody seen this video? Yeah. Uh huh. Not good. Yeah, no, not good. I should have played the video, but I didn't have it queued up and I had these stored on my computer. The good news the plane that just lost a wing, they both had shoots on. So everybody lived out of this accident. This was in Wisconsin, Superior, Wisconsin. So my point here, now these guys were doing this on purpose, but we've had too many incidents and accidents and too many things out of St. Paul. And, you know, there was the, the couple of midairs in the pattern at St. Paul, and there was a couple of people that just the parachuters hit the airplanes. If there's an airplane symbol on that VFR chart, you need to go around those airports or be listening to that frequency. We do it out here at Winst, uh, Winston all the time so you know it's 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 our responsibility so this is just my plug for the FAA to say watch for traffic oh pre fight properly I think I threw a slide in that looks like this <laughs> this guy took this airplane and he flew it for a couple weeks on this flight, he flew it for three or four hours. I think he came back from Rapid City or something. And he was late. I had a lesson in this airplane. And I went out to pre-flight this airplane with my student and put fuel in it. And I popped the cowling and look what I found. You think we have a possible fire hazard here? Anybody care for some scrambled eggs? 
<laughs> Look at this. Think he did a proper pre-flight? I don't. <coughs> that airplane had to be parked for a little while. Okay, quiz time. What's that? Mooney. Oh, oh, why? Because the tail? Yep. That's the weirdest looking Mooney I ever saw. Oh, that's a pressurized Mooney. You said that might not? I'm calling a Moonanza. <laughs> <laughs> they only built just a handful of these. I don't even. Somebody can look up the end number if they want to know what it is. But I did see that in my And I'm like, what the? I finally had to walk over, and take a picture. What the crap is that? I mean, it's obviously a Mooney tail, but it's like a banana. Yeah, it's like a bonanza with pressurized Mooney. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I seen that. At, that's the only place I seen it was in my That was just a cool picture, but it was so small it doesn't look too cool. Oops. <laughs> 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 that was a bad day. Oops! This was just on the Michigan. I gotta figure out which airport. Notice this department requires no physical fitness. Everyone gets enough exercise. Jumping to conclusions, flying off the handle, running down the boss, knifing friends in the back, dodging responsibility, and pushing their luck. So that was so cute. I just had to take a picture. Oh, I got a bunch of hours, a bunch of dual given. I finally got my ATP. This was my first jet job. What's St. Cloud State? And he's a little goofy. This, I showed up in Iowa somewhere and they had me on the wall. I was really happy. <laughs> that was, so they must have an instructor or somebody there named Greg who's also a little bit off the wall. Oh, wait, no. oh, look how innocent that kid became. And then he went through that phase. And now he's eating dinner in fun places like, oh, that was Hilton Head or down there. Gotta just play with this with you. <laughs> Little tailwind. Freaking A! This airplane has a Mach 87 red line. I didn't play it for you, but if you want another really cool video, there is a Falcon 50 Mach Overspeed. You Google that on YouTube, Falcon 50 Mach Overspeed. The engineer and the pilot go up on the test plane and they're like, hey, we just want to show you this is cool. They run that airplane up to 9.6, do two 45 degree bank turns and like a 2G pull up. No flutter, no problems, no big deal. I'm like, this thing is a tank. Falcon Dassault was building fighters. So this was a heavy iron company that built a couple of business jets and of course their newest equipment is just amazing the, the falcon you know 2000 and the easy you know new stuff and of course this is another thing that just blows my mind after being you know a 152 and cherokee 140 pilot that taught out a crystal for a while wondering if i was going to clear the trees in the summer you know <laughs> pegging the vsi in a climb but then we talked about those astronauts earlier, didn't we? There, that one was already, and they just flew the second one of these the other day, so they're getting closer to doing something. Hoovard, Hoovard Hazy Museum. This is just south of Dulles. If you ever go to Dulles, this is like three miles from the airport. It is free to get in. I went four times in one month. <laughs> and now I've gone like six times in the last six months because I kept flying with different pilots that hadn't been there. I'm like, give them it, let's go. And then they've got some movies that are super cool and an IMAX. Uh, one of the movies I saw was like the Top Gun training, you know, but like the 90 minute or six, it's like 50 minutes long like the reality one. I'm like, that was so cool. But you know, there's the SR-71. You can't touch it, it's locked up. Here's the shuttle. Uh, the first, one of the Falcon 20s from FedEx is in there, because FedEx started with five Falcon 20s. Um, the Enola Gay, the actual airplane's in there. Um, there's a Concorde, it's just like, oh. So the things I get to do with my new job are so much fun. So that brings me into the next thing with the SR-71. Let's see, is that the same guy? It's close, I don't know. I'm just gonna read it. There are a lot of things we couldn't do in an SR-71, but we were the fastest guys in the block and loved reminding our fellow aviators of this fact. I'm gonna skip down. They were doing our final training sortie. We needed 100 hours in the jet to complete our training to be mission ready status. We were beginning to feel, I was beginning to feel a bit sorry for Walter in the back seat. There he was with no really good, incredible view of the sights before us. He was over Arizona looking at the California coast at 80,000 feet. When a priority transmission from head grab, blah, blah, good practice, he was running the radios in the back, 
just to get a sense of what Walt had to contend with, I pulled the radio toggle switches and monitored the frequencies along with him. The predominant radio channel was from Los Angeles Center, far below us, controlling daily traffic in their sector. While they had us on their scope, albeit briefly, we were in uncontrolled airspace and normally would not talk to them unless we were needed to descend into their airspace. We listened to the shaky voice of a lone Cessna pilot who asked Center for a readout of his ground speed. Center replied, November Charlie 175, I'm showing you at 90 knots on the ground. Now the thing to understand about center controllers is whether they're talking to a rookie pilot in a Cessna or Air Force One, they always spoke with the exact same calm, deep, professional tone that made one feel important. I referred to it as a Houston center voice. I've always felt after years of seeing documentaries in this country's space program, listening to the calm and distinct voice of the Houston controllers, that all controllers have since wanted to sound like that. And they basically did. And it didn't matter what sector of the country we would be flying in. It seemed like the same guy was talking. Over the years, the tone of that voice had become somewhat comforting sound to pilots everywhere. Just moments after the Cessna's inquiry, a twin beach popped up. Twin beach? What the crap is a twin beach? I get some pictures of one in the end. It's almost a barren. Popped up on the frequency in a rather superior tone asking for his ground speed. I have you at 125 knots ground speed. Boy, I thought that Beechcraft must really think he's dazzling his Cessna brethren. Then out of the blue, a Navy F-18 pilot on NS Lemore came off a frequency. He said, you knew right away it was a Navy jock because he sounded very cool in the radios. Think Top Gun. Center, Dusty 52 ground speed check. Before Center could reply, I'm thinking to myself, hey, Dusty 52 has a ground speed indicator in that million dollar cockpit. Why is he asking Center for a readout? Oh, then I got it. Dusty here is making sure that every bug smasher from Mount Whitney to Mojave knows what his true speed is. He's the fastest dude in the valley today, and he just wanted everyone to know how much fun he's having in his new Hornet. And the reply, as always, came with that same calm voice with more distinct alliteration than emotion. Dusty 52 center, we have you at 620 on the ground. And I thought to myself, this is, a, is this a ripe situation or what? As my hand instinctively reached for the mic button, I had to remind myself that Walt was in control of the radios. Still, I thought, it must be done! In mere seconds, we'll be out of the sector and the opportunity will be lost. That hornet must die and die now. <laughs> I thought of all our sim training and how important it was that we developed well as a crew and knew that to jump in on the radios would destroy the entire integrity of all that we had worked towards becoming. I was torn. Somewhere 13 miles above Arizona, there was a pilot screaming inside his space helmet. Then I heard it, the click of the mic from the back seat. That was the very moment I knew that Walter and I had become a crew. <laughs> very professionally and with no emotion, Walter spoke. Los Angeles Center Aspen 20, can you give us a ground speed check? There was no hesitation and the reply came as if it was an everyday request. Aspen 20, I show you at 1,842 knots across the ground. <laughs> I think it was the 42 knots that I liked best. So accurate and so proud was Center to deliver the information without hesitation. You knew he was smiling, but the precise point at which I knew Walt and I were really going to be good friends a long time when he keyed the mic once again to say in his most fighter pilot-like voice, Ah, Center, much thanks. We're showing closer to 1,900 on the money. <laughs> For a moment, Walter was God. We finally heard the little crack in the armor of the Houston Center voice. When LA came back with, oh, Roger Aspen, your equipment's probably more accurate than ours. You boys have a good one. <laughs> it had lasted for just moments, but in that short, memorable sprint across the Southwest, the Navy had been flamed. All mortal, airplane, all mortal airplanes on the frequency were forced to bow before the King of Speed. And more importantly, Walter and I had crossed the threshold of being a crew. A fine day's work. We've never heard another transmission on that frequency all the way to the coast. For just one day, it was truly fun being the fastest guy out there. So, those pictures I showed you. Pfft. All right. There's what I'm flying. We do a fair amount of air ambulance. We've got two airplanes. We got two jets and one, uh, this is a Platus, set up for uh, air ambulance stuff. This is actually a NICU unit. So we will transport preemies or uh, born, you know, small kids uh, that are in distress, just got born, or going somewhere for surgery. And then we'll do adults and, and all that stuff too. So we've done a lot of stuff. Our primary is kind of the yeah, about halfway into all the surrounding states. They will call us with the jet for transports to Boston and Philly and you know California and stuff like that. Um, most rewarding part of my job 
when you know you're out there in the middle of the night saving somebody's life or possibly saving somebody's life um, and, and, and that just makes you feel really good. Um, so that's, that's a fun thing to do. This was up north in International Falls. They hit a deer. He goes, this is less than a week old. <laughs> they just got a brand new ambulance and they hit a deer. They were just, oh. <laughs> There's the Northern Lights with a sunrise picture. This was probably a 3.30 in the morning call out to go from here to Seattle for something. Uh, just had a cool opportunity to almost sort it. We, we saw them just for a long time. Hard to take a picture of, but just was super cool. I instructed at the equivalent of 141 school for a while before I came to in-flight. Uh, JAL in Napa had uh, like 36 bonanzas and 20 barons that they did training in um, for the guys that, you know, would go 300 hours later, they would be in the right seat of a oh, Boeing 777 going transatlantic. Let's not talk about that. There's just a weird one. This thing had some crazy stall kit on it, but they needed the little wing in front to keep everything going when he extended. I should have had him put these down to show, but his, his takeoff and landing distance was crazy small his stall speed was ridiculous like 22 knots or something so that was just the weirdest thing i've seen besides that that was yeah where's that flying clown you know when your paint's ugly you might as well make it worse so you know that it's ugly right i'm sure that was a latex and hand brush did you have to reweigh it after doing that i don't know I've got to go to fun places that I'd never been before because I'd never been to Vegas. Oh, I showed up there during the Miss America contest, except it was really hard to find a hotel room. Look who else was there. I got trumped. I ate a burger. Whose restaurant is that? Gordon Rams. Gordon Rams. Thank you. Oh, got to go there. There's a two weeks for me. Like Lebanon, Nina. I never know where I'm going. So the problem is clothes. I, I don't know whether to bring long underwear and a heavy jacket or flip flops and shorts. So I kind of have to bring it all, except it all has to fit into a roller bag. That's here. Seattle. Okay, there's one of my students. He bought this four thousand dollars. This is a pull start single mag ultralight that weighed two hundred fifty six pounds. He didn't have his tailwheel endorsement, so he needed to come to me, and we flew the champ until he got his tailwheel endorsement. But he was still afraid to fly his airplane. So for like a year, he didn't fly his airplane. And finally, he had this up north at a little airport, 45 minutes or an hour north of here. And I was flying up there in a small plane and I was gonna hang out a couple hours. And I called him and said, I am going to Aiken. What time will you be there? 11, I will be there. He pulled out his airplane, which he did not build, he bought. Bolted the wings back together on. Pre-flighted it really good. And maybe a guy like me, I'm not sure, I'm not admitting this, took this around the patch for him a couple times. Stupidest thing an instructor ever did. <laughs> Those are wheels on a shaft. There are no bearings. <laughs> I love this plane. It, you know, so I just took it around and did a stall or two and landed and I said, get in it, you're flying. And I made him go fly. So then he's flown ever since. Now he has a $4,000 airplane that burns about like two gallons an hour. It's just ridiculous, whatever it is, it's something crazy. And then that one was actually, Experimental, but he had a registration number, so I did a BFR on that. Oh, that was another second most interesting thing I'd probably ever done. Sad day. What's that? That's that beach. It's cross street. Yeah, it's the beach 18. So we knew the girl in that that got killed really well. Got to respect your airplanes. Can't be afraid of them. Got to respect them. There's the Twin Beach. He departed 1-8, lost an engine, went right down the engine splat. 
<laughs> Those guys got hurt, but they weren't dead. Um, airplane didn't do very well, did it? Where are we? <coughs> Somebody's doing touchy goes in a big fat airplane. Now this was coming back with Mark Nyquist in a Mooney he bought. I had three pictures and I didn't grab the right ones. There was a B-52 bomber at about a thousand AGL buzzing around here. <laughs> And I have a picture of him, and he's about this big on you know the picture that I have, and I just didn't get the right one. I was going to go, okay, there's a B-52 in here. Who can find it? There's a prize, and then go to the next screen and circle it. But I, I just didn't have the right picture last night. I, I didn't pull the right ones. That's northern Minnesota. Is it Thief River, maybe? But look at that sky. Oh, and there's looking out the right wing, and there's looking out the right wing. So you could see what we had. This is when you're happy to be on the ground instead of flying, you know? I love thunderstorms if I'm on the ground. Minneapolis, Minneapolis, let's see, who is that? That might have been Joe, I don't remember. Oh, Fagan, Granite Falls. If you guys get out there, so cool. He's got some of the coolest stuff. Not very far, good day trip. Find out what their hours are. I think they're charging five bucks or something. They weren't even open as a museum one or anything when I was there. That's a Noka. He's around. He's, that's the loudest thing out there, man. I tell you. I did not do this. <laughs> but we didn't know who did. And this was on an airplane I was flying. So for like the next four months, I took pictures pre and post every time I flew this airplane to prove that I didn't flat spot them because I didn't want to be accused of it. And then I get to see airplanes torn apart in all kinds of conditions. If you can get into maintenance hangars, it's so cool. It's just the best. Oh. Time to get out of your seats and blow this pop stand. Bye now.